Um, hello. So um, welcome to the Python class. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Python three class. Um, last class we talked about um variables. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, hello. Okay. So um, I think you can hear me now. So hello to everyone. So um, last class we talked about um Python variables. How we can get Python variables? We talked about strings. Um. So now, in this class, we're going to be talking about Python data types, the different data types in um Python. Uh, so, um, as you can see on your screen, we have um all the Python data types. Um, all the data types we have in Python. So, as you can see in programming languages, um, data types is an important concept. Variables can be stored in different data types, and different data types can do different things. These are the following data types we have in Python. We have the string. You can see um, when we started the class, we um, wrote something called a low word. We said print a low word, and we wrote a low word inside a string. So that's a string. And we have um, that's the text type. So the text type is string. So anytime you want to write the text, anytime you want to print out a text, um, or you want to write a text in um, Python, you write it in string. That is in quotation mark in a quotation. So um, we have the numeric type. I'm sorry. The numeric type is um, we have the int, we have the float, we have complex. So um, the numeric. Sorry about that. Um, the numeric type. We have int, float, and complex. So when you want to write um, a number, we have the, there are different ways to write numbers in in um, Python. So for the int, which is integer, we have integer. Then we have float, and we have complex. Integer is um, writing single numbers. Uh, so um, when you write single numbers in Python, just like one, two, or negative one minus one minus two that is integer but um for floats when you have a decimal place in a number that is float so that is float data type so automatically when you assign a number to a variable you are also assigning the data type the data type of that number to that variable so if i say x is equal to five i'm saying x is automatically an integer if I'm saying x is equal to um, 5.8, I'm automatically saying that x is a float. So um, for complex, we have, um, for instance, if I'm writing um, 5j, so if I'm writing 5j, um, for instance, that j is an imaginary number. For those of you um, who, learnt, who have learned um, complex number in mathematics, you will know about that um, imaginary numbers so um that is that those are the data types we have for um numeric those are the numeric types in python so int integer floats and complex so 5g now for instance is a complex data type then we have sequence data type which is um uh sorry which is um lists we have lists we have topple we have range. We're going to talk about that. You're going to see um, those different um, how to create lists, tuples, and range in um, Python. We have the mapping type, which is um, dict. We have set type, which is set and froze net. We have the boolean type, which is bool. So bool is either true or false. And then we have a um, binary type, which is bytes, bytes array, and memory view. So those are the data types we are going to be working with in Python. So if you have any question, you can um, write your question on the chat so I can answer your question. So I'm going to continue from there. Okay, so getting data types in Python, for instance, if I'm writing, you can see in the example, I wrote X is equal to five, then print type X. So, <clears throat> 
So um, you can see it's root um, class integer. Uh, because I, like I said before, I said, if I assign five to X, that means I am automatically saying X is an integer because five is an integer. So it's telling us that um, the class now, the type of X is integer. So you can get the other types of an, any object by using type function um time function in python so we're going to get to functions where you you're going to be working with functions so there are um there are different ways of writing functions in um python so we're going to be getting to that so um print the other types of variables um so that's um, basically it for getting the data types of um different data types in python okay so those that's where we stopped in the um, last class so um that's where i continued from so let's start this um class okay um please come in okay so this is the slide for this class um, we are going to be so um as you saw that's that's the slide for this class we are going to be talking about um this class um this class we're going to be talking about we are going to be um um broadening our knowledge on different data types and how to work on integers and um, fluid as you saw before the different data types we have um so if um so if you have worked on you can say if you've worked on any uh, maybe since the last two classes we had um you've done anything you've um, created some things in python you can share it um, with us and um so for this class i'm going to be using like i said in the last class in the last class i said um i'm going to be using spider which is an ide for python so spider is an ide for python and uh, we have PyCharm. So um, this is how the spider looks like. This is how the spider looks like. You can see um, the console of the um, spider. Then this is how the PyCharm looks like. This is the PyCharm. So we can either use, um, we can, there are different, like I said in the first class, I said there are different IDs and text editors for Python, but I prefer using um spider you can use jupyter book you can use spider you can use um vs code visual studio code you can use um pycham so for this class i'm going to be um, for this class and for other class i'm going to be using um both spider and pycham to just show us the examples uh the examples we are going to um the things we are going to create in python so um coming okay so um like i said we are going to be checking our knowledge on data types so um if you've created anything like variables can you see the different different variables you've created or different projects you've created um during according to what we've done in the last two classes if you've created anything using what we've done in the last two classes um can you just show us what you've done can you just um type what you've done so we can know um where you've reached in the python class so i'm going through the chat now so if you've done anything um related to the last class maybe it's just creating um variables as an example Someone said he tried downloading Python. It was not showing me how to create. Um, which Python did you download the Python console? Or did you download any IDE? Which IDE did you download? Is it is it the Python console itself or the I or an IDE? So you can see if it's a Python console or an IDE. So um you can use both the videos from the two last two um from the last classes to um check to cross check what you've done 
so um i i give i give an example in the last two classes so you can check those example and use it to create um things to integrate things in your uh, python so we're going to be going to today's class So we're going to be going to today's class. Um, okay. Um, so today's class, we're going to be talking about Python numbers. Okay, so um th that's the data type in um that's it um so these are the data types in python so we're going to be talking about the numbers type in python so there are three numeric types in python we have the int we have the float and we have the complex so like i said before the int sorry <coughs> like i said before the int um is a single number for, um like one two three four negative one minus one minus two minus three zero so those are integers int for short so variables of numeric types are created when you assign a value to them so um i said if you assign one to x for instance you're automatically saying x is equals to is an integer if i'm saying y is equal to 2.8 that means i'm saying that y is a float so z is equals to one j like i said a, a complex number so that is it's complex it's comprising of um, a, a number and a letter and j there is an imaginary number is an imaginary number so if you've dealt with um complex number before um you know what i'm talking about so it's it's just a data it's just a um data type so when, when, when you're calculating or dealing with complex numbers in um um in Python, um, this is what this is the data type you're going to be using. So, x is equals to one, which is an int integer. Um, y is equals to um, two point eight, which is the float. And you can see the hash. Like I said in the last class, that that hash means comment. So if you want to comment in Python, you have to use the hash before writing your comment. It's good to comment in in when you're writing a program because it's good to make documentations when you're writing a program because um if another person wants to read your code he's going to know um this is what this code is for all right so this is what um so when you're writing your code if you want maybe i want to create um a game for instance i'm creating a game for instance so um uh, i'm creating a block in my game so i'm going to use my comments to say this is a program for block um, another comment, maybe I'm creating a um, wizard, um, a wizard, um, maybe it's a wizard game where they have different powers and stuff like that. So I'm going to say um, this is a wizard. This is the program for wizard. This is the program for the magic and stuff like that. So um, it's good to document your code when you're when you're writing um, your code. So you use the hash to write um a comment um, a comment in python so like i said before to check um i've said that this before to check um the types of any object in python you use the type function so if i say um type print type x you can try it um i'm going to also try it here so you can see so if i say print type x it's going to print um, we said our x is equal to one. So if I say print type x, it's going to print um, integer for me. Um, if I say print type y, it's going to print float. If I say print type x, it's going to um, type z, it's going to print um, complex. It depends on what you're assigning your variables to. If, I'm, if for instance, I assign x to 1.8, it's going to print float, not integer. So now integer int, or integer is a whole number positive or negative without decimal of unlimited length that means an integer can be um can be up to infinity it's of um unlimited length so you can see x is equals to one 
which is an integer y is equals to three five six seven that is an integer no matter how long the length is um z is equals to a negative number there it's also an integer so um i created um technical gamer said he created variables that's nice um um dami adebola said he created um sequence but i i used ide that's the python console that's also nice that is the um, python console you use the python console but you can also um the python console are just for maybe um for mini projects for, to just maybe when you want to create some mini project but when you're creating a big project you use you're going to be needing the id like python like spider so um to show to get what i'm saying to so that once you write once you write your code it displays what um it makes your writing your code easier so you can get the spider or the python so i'm um, sorry or the pi charm okay um someone said he's still learning okay that's good continue learning um someone just said he's going to create okay yeah that's good so float um float or floating point num float or floating point number is a number positive or negative containing one or more decimals <clears throat> so x is equals to 1.10 y is equals to 1.0 um z is equals to negative 35.59 those are float numbers so whether it be negative or positive it's still a float so um complex number like you like i said before complex number are written with j as the imaginary part so um if you've learned complex number before or complex um, number in mathematics you know what I'm saying? You, um, you see something like 5i plus 5j. Um, so those are complex numbers. So x is equals to 3 plus 5j. It's a complex number. Y is equals to 5j. It's a complex number. Z is equals to negative j. It's a complex number also. So um, we can change um different. We can change um different data types so for instance if i have an integer before i assigned my x to one and i want to change it to a float i want my uh x to be to be a float now like i want i don't want it to be an integer again so i can do that that's what we call type conversion so you can convert from one type to another with the int float and complex method so um x is equals to 1 y is equals to 2.8 z is equals to 1 g so our x for instance now is integer is an int so i want to convert from int to float so now i'm assigning another value i'm saying a is equals to float x so now my x is already an integer but if i'm saying x a is equals to x ordinarily i am saying my a is an integer automatically also because uh my x is an integer already so my x is a variable already so i'm now i'm now saying a is equals to x so automatically i'm saying my a is equals to the one inside my x which is an integer but now i don't want my a to be an integer i'm saying my a is a float so i'm using the float method to um tell a that um though x is an integer now i want you to be a float i don't want you to be an integer just like x so converting from um float to integer just like we did for a b is equals to int y um y is already uh y is a float already so now i am assigning my y to b but I am putting an int method telling my B that I don't want my B to be a float anymore. I want it to be an integer. So converting from integer to complex, just like we did before um, for the last two. So now if I print my A 
my B and my C, you'll see that it's going to give us uh, You can see um, what we've been talking about. Okay. So uh, let me. I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using um, spider. So let's use spider to check what I've been saying. So um, let's go to the other one. Okay. So I'm going to use spider to check my type. I'm going to be using the type function to check each type. So I'm going to be, uh, let's get to that. Okay. Okay, so. So anything I type in here, in here, um, you're going to be seeing the results in here, in this console here. So this is where I'm going to be writing my program. And this way, I'm going to be seeing the result of my program. Now, um, let's get to it. So I'm saying x is equal to one. Okay. Let me leave the space. Um, y is equal to one point four. Then um, z is equal to one or let's say two j okay so in other programming languages um some other programming languages you use or maybe if you've learned some other programming language you you, you see that at the at the end of um their program they're going to put a semicolon but in python you don't have to put a semicolon you just leave it like that in other programming language if you don't put that semicolon it's going to flag an error but in Python, Python does not need a semicolon. So um, take note of that. So now I'm saying um, print, sorry. I'm saying print Oh, sorry, okay. So now I'm saying print type type. I'm using the type function. So this is a function. So when I'm right, um, this is a function in uh, Python. So type x. So let's run it. Um, okay, let's run the program. So to run my program, you can see this green play button here. So okay, let, um, let's complete the program first. So let me write for others too. So type Y. I hope you can see this. I hope you can see what you what I'm doing. Um, someone can you can you hear me? Because someone said um you can't hear me now. Um. Okay, so I'm going to show you, since um, we're going to be using the spider, I'm going to show you, just like we installed, just like we installed the, uh, just like we installed the Python, um, it's the same way we are going to be installing the spider. So just go online, type spider on your Google Chrome or any browser you're using. You're going to see, um, go to the spider side then download spider from there. I hope you can hear me.
Okay. Okay, so um, I said type spider on Google, then um, you can see you you go to this. I'm going to show you before completing this class, so you can see um, how to install spider on your PC. So let's complete the program. So let's. And um, Z. So now to run our program, to run our program, I'm going to click on the play button. So uh, let's click on the play button. Um, sorry. Okay. So now you can see that uh, it's showing us the um the type. You can, I said I'm going to write my program here, here, and I'm going to be getting the results here. So now you can see print type X. So it's giving us an int as an integer, a type int as the type for X. So print type Y is giving us float for type Y and is giving us complex for type X. I'm sorry, type Z. Um, so let's go to let's check other examples. Um, let's check other examples. Okay, so we we are going to do we are going to do the um type conversion examples. So um we are going to do the type conversion examples. Okay. So let's go to the type conversion examples. Let's go to type conversion examples. Um, so now let's convert. Let me show you the commenting I said before. So I'm going to leave that as is. So this is comments. So you can see the color changed. um convert x to this code to be left out but you don't want to clear it you can comment it out so so now we are saying a is equal to um int int y oh sorry it said it floats float x sorry but I said we are converting x to float. So float x. Okay. Um what 
Oh, sorry. I think the network, the network is a bit glitchy today. Sorry. So the network is a bit bad today. It's been good since morning. I don't know why it's bad now. So if um you can hear me, so let's continue. I think it's back. I think the network is back. So um so now we are saying B. Sorry. I think B is equal to converting. Let me write the comment there. So convert convert uh y to integer. So now we are saying b equals to int. I hope I'm not too fast. I hope you can hear me and I'm not too fast. And I hope you can see the screen. Um, it's not too tiny. Um, let me enlarge this so you can. Okay, it's not. I don't know why it's not zooming in. Okay, so um, b is equals to int y. Okay, and um, convert. And what should we convert our z to? Let's see what we converted our z to in an example. Okay, so we convert from complex to and from int. Okay. So in our example, we converted x to we converted x to float and we converted x to um we converted c um x to complex. The reason why we can convert from um we can convert from a complex to an integer or float is because we are having a number and um, we're having a letter there. So one j, for instance, we can, it can be converted to integer. So one j can't be converted to integer because it has a letter um, attached to it. So now let's go. But for others, you can convert it to you can convert a float to integer, you can convert integer to float, you can convert integer to complex, you can convert a float to complex. So but you can convert a complex to float and you can convert a complex to an integer. So now let's convert let's convert um that x to complex also now we are saying c is equal to complex x and now we are printing let me just copy this and paste it so i don't have to be writing it so now we're going to be checking the type for A, the type for B, and the type for C. Okay, so now if I should run this now, okay, so um, let me comment this out so you can see it properly. Okay, so let me comment this that out. So now I don't need that code. That's why, but I don't want to um delete it. So that's why I just commented it out. So um now we have you can see we changed our x to float. So for a now, 
it's a fruit, for B, it's an integer, and for C, is a complex um, number. So let's print, let print, let's print the value for all uh, variables. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So now let me run it. As you can see, um, it's saying 1.0 for A because we have converted it to um and we have converted it to a float so now it's added um a decimal point so it's saying 1.0 for b it said it says um one because you know why before is 1.4 it's removed the four it's removed the point four because it's uh it's a decimal so we don't want the decimal for integer. So now there is one. So for C, it's saying one plus zero J. It's added a complex, um, it's added zero J to make it a complex number. So you can see zero J is also equals to zero. It's just adding the J. So it can tell us that this is a complex um, number. Okay. So let's continue. Okay, so um I hope it's not glitchy again, it's back to how it is. I hope it's not glitchy and it's back to how it is. So if you have any question or you want me to um, recap on what I did before. So um, someone said, I cannot see the screen. I, I don't understand. So um, please, what don't you understand there so I can explain again? Okay. So if you don't understand anything, if you don't understand anything, please um, um say so I can um you know recap on what we've been doing before i start um what's next on the agenda okay since i'm not seeing any comments i hope you understand what i've been saying okay so now let's go to booleans so python booleans we are going to um we've talked about um data types in python so now we're going to be talking about booleans in python um please it's better you um please let's uh understand what i've been saying because if you don't understand it's going to be hard for you to go on okay so uh, let me recap what I've been saying since. Um, so um, let's start from the data type. So I said um, data types, there are different data types in Python. We have the text type string, um, which we talked about in the last class. We talked about string in the last class. So we have, um, we have the number type. Uh, we have the sequence type we have the boolean type so we have um, the integer we have the float um we have the complex uh, type so those are the data types we have um in python like i said before so uh we i showed you an example of how those data types are so um let's let me show you an example again 
okay so i said x is equals to one is an integer so i said one so assigning one to x or assigning two or assigning a single number which does not have a letter to it or does not have a decimal place is an integer so integers are um it can be up to infinity it does not matter if an integer since it doesn't have since is it doesn't have um, a decimal place or a, a letter attached to it so i can write three four six seven eight ten um three four six seven nine like you saw do um that long number you saw before is an integer so now assigning one to um one as an integer one is the integer already so assigning it to x is telling the program that look x is now an integer because one is an integer so x is an integer so for me assigning 2.8 or any other decimal um, number to y now or if i assign it to x is also telling the uh, um the program that see i'm um, telling python that see now now, since I'm assigning two point, I'm also telling you that y is a float. Now, z is equals to one j. So I said, if you've um, maybe you've come across this in mathematics, you see the you when you talk about different um, complex numbers, when you get to complex number in mathematics, um, that's when you use this um, one j, where j is the imaginary part, where you solve for the imaginary part and something like that so in python we have um the complex um numeric type so the complex numeric type is 1j 2j uh 1 plus 2j so th those are complex um numeric type so now i said to check for types in python um you use the type function to check for different um types whether it be an integer, whether it be a string, whether it be a list, whether it be a boolean. So you can check, you can use the type function to check for the other type. So if I assign x to five, for instance, and five is an integer. Now I'm saying um, print type x. So since five is an integer and I'm assigning that five to x, I'm telling it that that type is an integer if i assign um y to 2j and 2j is a complex um type so i'm automatically saying you should print the type um, of y which is complex and for um maybe print type x, x like yeah, type, type z which i showed you that type z is equals to maybe um type z is equals to 1j yeah, which is a complex I can assign z to anything i can assign z to anything so it doesn't matter whether it is um, a complex i can um as long as um i assign something to it so if i say z is equals to two so automatically i'm saying z is an integer Hello. Okay, so um, my name is Kene Okafo, and I'll uh, be discussing computational thinking with you. So last week we started our discussion on computational thinking, and today we will further that discussion. But uh, let me quickly share my screen. Just a moment. Okay. So, if you can, can you see the screen? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, 
All right. So, um, what? Who remembers what uh, decomposition is? Does anyone remember what decomposition is? Anyone? Could leave um, a comment. Leave a comment on the chat box and let me know. All right, so uh, while we're expecting comments, I would go on with the class. So last time we discussed decomposition and we said that decomposition is simply breaking down a task, breaking down a problem into smaller manageable chunks. Because uh, the bigger it is, the harder it is to um, understand. The more complex it is, the more difficult it is to understand. But if you can, and break up the problem, small those, uh, solve those smaller individual, individual tasks, then you find that at the end of the day, you would have um, solved the entire problem. So looking at the composition today, let's see, I, I believe we can all see my screen. I've tried to make it uh, the font as large as possible. So let's see, a sales scenario. Compute the, compute the value of the amount that will be paid for. I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to the assignment that I gave us last week. There, there was this question I asked us to consider, so, but we'll come back to that. But let's look at this now. Compute the value of the amount that will be paid for the purchase of a number of items at a discount of 15%. At a discount of 15% of total purchase. So we have the example there. You have two books. It's 40 naira for one, one copy, 40 naira. Three bags. You get one at 240 naira. And then one pencil costs 20 naira. Now the question is, can we decompose this problem with a view to solving the problem that is getting the amount that should be paid after the discount has been deducted. So can anyone, can you guys just try to attempt that? It's, it's fairly simple, you know, quite simple, I would say. But I, we, we are interested in the thinking process. Break down the problem. So I've given some prompts here, or some um, tools if you would. Now, um, list, you list the items, List out the items first, then compute the price of the number of each item purchased. So two books, for example, how much am I paying for the two books? What's the price for two books? What's the price for three bags? What's the price for one bag? And then the, the other thing, I also need to know how much I'm to pay for one bag. So we need to get all those prices the price, the total for this commodity or this product, what's the total price for this commodity, what's the total price for this commodity or product, if you would. And then the next step, having found the prices of the different products, it's time to add them up. You add up those, um, those prices, okay, and then, Having added up the prices, you go to the next uh, step of that problem, which is deduct. Okay, first you find out what the discount is. What's the discount? I have added up all the prices, so I know what the total price is before um, the discount is applied. And then afterwards, I need to know what that discount amount is. When I get the discount amount, the discount amount, I would then take that discount amount away from the prices I initially, the total price that I initially obtained, then I will be left with what I am to pay, how much I am to pay. I hope that's not too confusing. I would like comments, and I would like you to perhaps get a jotter, get a, um, a sheet of paper and try to, try to break down this problem. I need you guys to think. 
it's all about thinking. Remember, computational thinking is about thinking. What's the um, most effective way to solve a problem? The first thing is that I need to break down the problem if it is breakable. Okay. All right. Any comments or answers? Anyone? Okay, so I'll go move on to the next slide now. Let's look at it. I'll share my screen. Sorry, that went off just a while ago. All right, so we see here. We see that first of all, I need to get the um, amount for each of those items, the total amount for each of those um, items there, right? And then the next thing I will do is that I would add up those prices. And then, having got the amount for all the items purchased, I would find out what the discount is. So if it's a 40% discount, I know I'm simply going to do 40% of what the total amount is, what the total price is, 40% of that. When I get that 40%, the next thing I'm to do, because you know, the customer is not supposed to pay that you know, large amount of money yet. I need to now remove the discount calculated based on you know, the discount percentage. And so I will remove that amount and I will be left with what the customer is to pay. Do we get that? Oh, it's quite, quite, quite. All right, so that's that. You see, eventually what the amount is you see that it is it is what 640 naira so two books how much 15 naira for one that's 100 naira three books at 220 for one that's 660 and one one uh, one i mean sorry three bags at 220 for one that's 660 naira then one pencil at 40 naira add that add all these prices and you have 800 naira. So what's, and the discount amount is what, 20%. So what's 20% of the prices, the sum of those prices, which is like 800. So what's 20% of 800? One, when you compute that, 8% eight, eight of, 20% um, of 800 is 160. So the final amount to be paid will be the price, the sum of the prices, the prices sum minus the discount sum which is like 800 minus 160. That's 640 Naira. Okay, so I guess that wasn't too difficult. Let's look at another, another instance here now. Okay, so I'll share my screen once again. So we we'll see here on her birthday. On her birthday, right? Mary got two blue dolls from her aunt, one red doll from her sister, three black dolls from her mother. She put all the doors in a bag that was empty. So there was nothing in the bag initially. Now, how many doors are there in the bag now? It seems simple, yeah, because of course, we know we are not that um, young. We can actually think abstractly. So I need us to, um, on, on a sheet of paper, break down the steps. Let's see the steps we have to take to arrive at our 
final answer. So, we'll see what the thought process is like. You see what the th thought process looks like on the on the screen. All right. Let me see if there are comments. All right. So, does anyone have a response? Any response? Every day, Mary got two blue dolls from her aunt, one red doll from her sister, and three black dolls from her mother. She put all the dolls in the bag that was empty. How many dolls are there in the bag? So, first of all, we need to abstract. Remember, we are looking at abstraction this time. And what is abstraction? Taking off all irrelevant, unnecessary um, details. Just like removing you know, the, the feathers of um, a chicken before you cook to eat, right? So you need to take off the feathers. So that's what abstraction is like. You need to remove those distractions, those unnecessary pieces of information so that you are left with what is actually um, important to solving the problem. So breaking down this now, remove every other piece of so here now we're not interested in the color of the of the dolls. Remember abstraction. We are not asked to count the number of blue dolls. We are asked to find out how many dolls all together. So the color of the doll does not really count in this instance. So we're going to abstract that away, right? So, ball from ant, we need how many balls did ant give? Two. Balls from sister, how many did she give? One. Balls from mother, how many? I put all those balls, you see, step by step. I can now conceptualize the problem. I can now see how to go about it because I now have figures for the solution. I put all the balls in the bag that I don't know how many there are. So the next thing I'm going to do is all the balls in the bag, what's the amount? So balls in bag stands for the number of balls in the bag. So this is like a storage. As the first teacher said, a variable is a what? A container to store values. So I'm storing that particular um, number of doll, balls all together in this variable called balls in bag. But I don't want to use them terms that are peculiar to programming yet. So then I need to know how many balls from ant as we. So I uh, balls from ant is what? Two. So that's stored in balls from aunt. How many balls from sister? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I mixed up. I repeated balls from aunt, balls from aunt, balls from aunt. But sorry, that should actually be, that should be balls from sister and this should be balls from mother. Sorry about that. Balls from mother. So how many balls from sister? One. And how many balls from mother? Three. So add up these number of balls, I get six. So there are six balls all together in, in the bag. So right here, we've used both decomposition, that is breaking down the problem into steps, right? Breaking down the problem. And then we have also used abstraction, that is removing information that is not helpful. Removing information that is not necessary. You know, so we can focus on the vital or important thing in the question or the task. Okay, so now let's let's look at 
um, abstraction, you know, that is also, again, as I said, abstraction is about removing in, unimportant or unnecessary or irrelevant um, information. So this is the question that I asked us last week. I'm going to share, I'm going to um, share my screen so we see. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Dami. Dami Adebola. Thank you. Uh, the composition is the process of breaking down complex problems using algorithms and flowcharts. That's outstanding. I am in love with this definition. That's what it is. You break down, you break the problem. That shows understanding, but you have um, perhaps read on your own, and that's good. You studied on your own. Okay, so let's this particular um, problem here still involving abstraction and still involving decomposition and abstraction. Now there are. 90 people in line at a theme park at a theme park ride you know waiting to get on the ride now every five minutes 40 people get on the ride and 63 join the line how much time do you think it would take for 600 people to be in line so how long do you think it would actually take for, for us to have um, at least, at least 600 people? So that is actually, you need to understand, you know, the semantics there. Estimate how long it takes for 600 people to be in line. Actually means how long would it take for us to have at least 600 people on the line? So we need to um, decompose the problem. We need to decompose the problem, right? And how do we do that? Let's, and also abstract the problem. Let's break it down now. Remove unnecessary information. Remove irrelevant information. Initial in line, that is, initial in line there is something I'm just using to denote, to denote the number of people at the theme park, at the line in the theme park, at the very beginning, at the beginning of the process. So that's 90 people. There were 90 people, or there are 90 people. I'll use the present uh, simple there. There are 90 people, and the time hasn't started counting. So that's why it is zero. You know, just like um, you are running a, a, a race, you start at zero. And then, you see, after five minutes, every five minutes, 63 people join the line. So you see, so I, I guess that at the end of, for example, the first minute, there will be 90 plus 63 people. And still at the end of that uh, first minute, 40 people get off the line to join the ride, to join the ride. So 60, um, 90 plus 63, and then I have to remove, the, I have to take off the number of people that actually went off the line to join the ride. So that will be 90, right? plus 63 that joined the line, minus 40 that went off the line. So you notice this, I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in a, a pattern recognition here. So there is, there is a pattern here, 63 line, 40 gets off. How many people actually joined the line? How many people? actually joined the line that's the question guys you need to think 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 about it 63 people joined the line and at that same moment at that very uh, moment 40 40 people went off the line to join the ride now the question is how many people actually for that time joined so we know that it's simply a difference, difference between 
how many people joined at that time and how many people left at that time. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. You know this issue of um, two steps forward. I mean, um, one step forward, two, two steps back, backward. Right? That is that progress? Is that progress? One step forward, two steps backward. It means if you look at it, you see that the person is actually going back one step for every iteration. The person goes back one step. So there's a deduction, there's a backward movement. That's why it's, it's kind of like a proverb, right? One step forward, two step backwards. The person is not making progress. The person is not even stagnant. The person is actually what? Regressing. The person is actually going back. Because it means that if I'm moving forward one step, and then I now take two steps back, two steps back minus one step forward. So the step backward is small, right? The step backward is small. So two minus one, I have one step backward. So I'm actually moving one step backward at any given, at any given time. One step backward, one step backward. You can think about it, think about it. There are five people. I mean, I, I am five meters away from my house. I'm five meters away. I move one step forward. So five minus one, I'm four meters away now from my house, right? You know, five meters away, that's my starting point. Five meters away from my house. I move one step forward. I'm closer to my house now. So that's four meters away. Then I move two steps backward. So from the four meters, from the position of four meters, I move two steps backwards. So that's what five and what six. So I'm actually doing four plus two meters away from my house. I'm adding two, but in a backward direction. So I'm actually six meters away. But you wonder, ah, started at five, I moved forward. So I came to four meters away from my house. And then something bad now happened. I behaved foolishly and went two meters back. So when you measure my distance at that time, it, I'm actually six meters away from my house. So we need to know the, the difference between the number that joined the line and the number that left the line. So that's 20, 23, 23, 23 people for every five minutes. Every five minutes, my dear, 23 people join the line. Every five minutes, 23 people join the line. So now let's look at it now. Let's, let's see, let's see. Let's, let's have a look at it. Um, every five minutes, the three people join the line. So five minutes at the end of at the end of five minutes. So initially you have initially you have ninety people. Then at the end of five minutes, remember when you do the math, sixty three minus forty, you have twenty three. So twenty three people actually joined. So at the end of five minutes, you you have one hundred and thirteen people joining the line. And then at the end of the next five minutes, so I'm actually doing, if you look at it, the next five minutes, I have end of five minutes. The end of the next five minutes will actually be 10 minutes. Bring it down to math, that's actually five multiplied by two. That's 10 minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, five times two minutes, I have 90 plus 23 times two. Because I'm, I'm going to add another 23 to the initial 23. So by the end of the, by the end, at the end of 10 minutes, I have 23 times two people plus 90. That's 136. I want you to notice a pattern. Remember, it's all about computational thinking. You, 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 you may find the composition, you may find abstraction, and you may, for the purpose of making decisions, you may recognize patterns. And based on those patterns, you can reach conclusions, right? So um, 23, 90 plus 23 times two. So at the end of second, at the end of the, of the 10th minute, you have 46 plus 90 people. That's 136. 
at the end of you know the next five minutes will be 15 minutes i i, I stopped at 10 minutes at five another five minutes that's at the end of 15 minutes that will now be another 23 so it, it, will, it will be like i have 23 end of first minute 23 plus 23 added to 90 end of second end of um, 10 minutes and then 23 plus 23 plus 23 people those are that's the number of people that join 23 plus 23 plus 23 which is 23 times 3 so 23 times 3 people added to the 90 people that were there initially i have the number of people that will be in line at the end of the 15th minute so that's 159 so i want to see something here now the minutes there the y there is actually the same as what you have 23 times that particular number so end of four minutes if i if i make y four minutes now so it will be five times four 20 minutes the end of 20 minutes you have 23 times four people added to the 90 that you know you had there at the beginning and on and on and on so guys let's see can someone so if let's say we have four minutes let's say we have four minutes at the end of if the question now i'm trying to rephrase the question what do you think um what, okay let me rephrase that question now how long do you do you think it would take for us to have let me just rephrase the question how long do you think it would take for us to have 120 people in line how long do you think it would take to have 120 people in line How long will it take to have 120 people in line? How long do you think it will take? How long do you think it will take to have 120 people in line? So can anyone think about it? Can you come up with an answer? How long do you think it would take us to have 120 people in line? I've made it simpler before we go back to having 600 people in line. I'm waiting for comments. I'm waiting for comments. So I have 90 people at the start. 63 join, 40 leave. So that's 23 people joining. At the end of the second minute, how many people do I, do I have? Anyone? 26 minutes, Dami Adebola, Dami Adebola. Okay, let's let's see, let's see. So I'm going to use um, a bit of Python. I'm going to use Python here. I'm going to use Python here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. I hope it's. I hope it will be um, bold enough. I hope it will be bold enough. Um, share screen. So can we see? Can we see the screen? So starting, starting peep.
Let me see if I can make this bigger, sorry. The size, I think I can make it uh, 20. Let me make the size. Let me make it uh, 40. Okay, so I hope that's better. So starts 90, that's pips, stands there for people. The number of people, 90 at the beginning, and you know, the, the time hasn't started counting. The new people joining the line 63, people leaving the line 40. So starting, so now we are going to do some thinking here now. What do I want to actually test? The number, the amount of time it will take for me to have 120 people, right? So, so long as we'll keep adding the 23 to what was there before, we'll keep adding 23, that is the difference, to whatever number was there first before the addition of the 23, right? And the number, you see that the number will keep increasing. And so we're going to check. So long as that number, which here is called starting pips, so long as that number, is less than or equal to 120. So if it's still less than 120, keep adding 23, keep adding 23 until to that, keep adding 23 to the uh, number of people there that is starting pips. Keep adding 23 until such a time when starting pips is more than 120. So for every 23 people that I add, I know that it has taken me five minutes. For every 23 people that I add, it has taken me five minutes. So that's another thing. So I need to increase my time. So if time was zero, I'll take that zero at five, the end of the first minute. That's one. And that time is one now. End of the next five minutes, that is time plus five and on. So you keep adding five minutes, five minutes to the previous time. So I'm going to run this code for us to see. I run the code here. I run the code for us to see. Uh, run module. That is, it will, it will take about 10 minutes. It will take about 10 minutes. Um, 120 divided by 23. No, um, no, no, no. It's, it's not, it's, it's not, think about it again. Just think about it. I have 90 people. Let's focus on this. I have 90 people. And then how long is it, go I mean, how, how much time will it take for me to have 120 people? If for every five minutes, 63 people leave and 40 join, I mean, 63 people join and 40 people leave. So you need to keep track of what the previous number of people is. Keep track of what the previous number of people is because it is to that number, it's not going to be 30 for every five minutes. I mean, it's not going to be 90 for every five minutes. What was the last one before you added 23 more people? You keep track of it. So let's go, guys. The first time, the first time my starting, the number of uh, starting people is what? 90. So that 90 plus um, the difference, I'll just call this difference. So that's 23. So 90 plus 23. So I'm going to store it as 113, 113, right? And the new time there now will be, I will now have 10 minutes. But 113 is not yet up to, it's not yet up to 120, right? So I'm going to do the same thing again. 113 plus another 23. What do we have? 
113 plus 23. That's 136. That's over. 136 is more than 120. So my code is not, is the, this particular iteration is going to stop. I will stop checking. So it's just going to be the very, very first time. That is 90 plus 23. That's 113 people. If I do another plus 23, I'm going to have something that goes beyond 120. And so you see that it will, act, it will take just 10 minutes because it's only once I'm going to add the 23 people to get 100 and 113. And so if I add five minutes to the time there, it will be, it, it, it will, it will be what? Five minutes rather. So our answer there is, is five, it's um, 10 minutes. So let's see. I'll run the code again. So it's going to take 10, 10 minutes. At the end, at the end of 10 minutes, I'm going to have uh, it's, it's going to take at the end of 10 minutes for me to have at least 120 people to be in the queue. Okay, so I think uh, our time is almost um, up. Let me now share another, just like an assignment. I'm going to leave us with an assignment. I'm going to leave us with an assignment. For us to think about, right? So let me enlarge this. Enlarge. Enlarge this, and I'll share the screen right away. Okay. This stuff keeps going up. Oh, the problem is. So like, let's see, guys. I, I have this here. Quickly note it down. Mohammed decided to track the number of leaves on the, on the tree in his backyard each year. The first year, there were 500 leaves. Each year after, the number of leaves was 40% more than the year before. So you need to keep track of what was there the year before. So now what do you think would be the number of leaves in Mohammed's backyard in the fourth year since he started keeping track? So just to give you an idea of you know, the sequence, First year, 500. Second year, 500 plus 40% of 500. That gives us 700. Third year will be like 700 plus, so you know the previous one is now 700. 700 plus 40% of 700 and on and on and on you go. But we can implement that since we are repeating the same thing. We can now do that with a loop. That makes our work easier. So I'll see you guys. Take note of this. I'll see us next week. We'll begin with the solution to this problem. So thank you everybody for you. being part of this class today. And thank you, Kenneth, for a very well done presentation. So uh, the assignment that you shared, well, we are going to try and share it on the Codarina Learning Portal too. So an emails will be sent across to everybody that part present in this class for them to be able to try it on. So thank you very much, very much, and uh, we we'll, hope we'll see you next week. So Kenneth, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.